Okay, everyone, thanks for coming. Uh, thanks for coming to the exhibition in the Cornerstone Gallery, which marks a return for the Cornerstone Gallery, which we're all really excited about. The Cornerstone Gallery, of course, has been underpinning the teaching at the Liverpool Hope for many years now, and one may have continued to do so. So, without further ado, I'm going to call on the two artists tonight who are going to speak about the exhibition, and uh, let's welcome Michael Stubbs and John Bunk. Okay, so I'm just going to run through what we're going to do this evening. Um, we're going to just change, mess with the format of talks a little bit here. So uh, we're going to do, we're going to run the, the program this evening um, in four parts. Uh, firstly, we're going to introduce the show, talk about what the artists did, why they did it, perhaps, um, and why we put the show together. We will then, ask, we will then um, put the whole thing out there for questions, okay? So we, after each section, we will um, ask you guys if you've got any questions or if you, want to make, you would like to make any suggestions, etc. So number one is to introduce the show to you. Number two, we're going to be talking about the processes of making for some of the artists, okay? Again, why they made, how they made, etc., etc. Then we'll ask, then we'll have a, a Q&A moment again, okay? Um, thirdly, we will talk a little about, a little bit about abstract paintings, histories. Um, I use it, I use the term in, in plural uh, deliberately um, because there are more than one history as far as I'm concerned. Again, after that third section, we'll have a few questions, <coughs> answers, perhaps we can start a dialogue by that point. And in uh, uh, the final section, we will talk about the relationship between embodied making and the disembodied screen. And by that I mean what it means to physically make something, given that we live in a <laughs> culture which seems to be the opposite, um, given that we live in a very screen-saturated uh, world. And then we'll have questions again, more generally. So John, you were going to um, offer to introduce the uh, 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 yeah, I mean, some of the premises, uh, or the premise for the show, and, and the themes of the show. What me and Mike were trying to sort of push out or uh, uh, involve the audience with, in terms of the artists we selected. And um, I guess really we should start with the, the title of the show, which has been a really interesting process for us to kind of explore. Signifiance. Uh, what what does that mean? Um, it was coined by a, a philosopher, uh, a linguist, uh, a literary theorist called Julia Kristeva. This name was a bug for me because the last time we were here, which was about four years ago, we did a talk there for the show that we produced for the gallery, and we were in the middle of our discussion, and I completely forgot the name of this philosopher and there's nothing more frustrating than that when you're trying to kind of get to grips with something and the name leaves you so when the when the you know we'd finished the talk i went straight to my bookshelves when i got back to try and root this person out and um, rediscover them because she was very much involved in how language how we interact with language and how language interacts with us uh, this two-way stretch i think with Roland Barthes, there was this idea that, um, you know, uh, I speak language, but language also speaks me. And she really went to town and really tried to work out how, lang how we imbue language with ourselves, but how also language contains us, how it formulates us, how it invents our subjectivity. And she coined this term signifiance, which is about this process of how we grow up with language, how power is used in language, who has the power in language. So once I got hold of her name and once I found this name, there was another connection, which is this book called um, Critical Perspectives on Contemporary Painting 
Okay, and this was a lovely connection because this was based on a show called uh, Hybridity. Uh, I think it was called International Contemporary Painting. And it was a show that took place at Tate in Liverpool. And this book was the culmination of discussions about contemporary painting at that time. And in this book, there are two, which I thought was really nice. The, there's one essay where there are two um, protagonists discussing the show in conversation. So rather than having an individual essay by an individual writer, you have this conversation where there are disagreements about what you're looking at. There are, there, it's Alison Rowley, who's a psychoanalyst, and Griselda Pollock, who's a very, very well-known uh, feminist art historian. And they were discussing this show, and it very much reminded me of me and Mike when we're discussing artists who we're working with or art artists that we're thinking of bringing together in a show. There are disagreements. There's, you know, there are those moments where you think, what the hell are you going on about? What, what, what are you seeing in this painting? I can't see what you're seeing, and vice versa. And then we work out, we, we, we have to play, you know, we have to persuade each other, and sometimes ourselves, that there's something happening in a painting that we think will add something to our show. So all these things came together, and it came together with this word signifiance, which was coined by Julia Christina. So that, I hope, it gives you a feeling of, of some of the ideas we were playing with. And I think it's that, that another idea of hers is this notion of intertextuality, which is one of those, you know, one of those words, again, like signifiance. But, you know, on a fundamental level, it's about the fact that language is open. Rather than being interpreting one individual author, you've got to remember that author works in relationship to the history of writing. And that all of us are involved in that history of writing. Uh, so rather than being tra you know, organised around this individual assertive author, who usually, you know, in the terms of the history of the canon, tends to be male, it's about opening up the idea of writing, uh, that their writing always works in relation to other writing. So there's always a history to their making. They misread history in their own way to produce something new. And this is something that we wanted or, uh, you know, that we discussed about, there was the connection for us, for our show. It's like looking at painting in terms of a, a bigger history, that every painting is not the sole amazing output of this individual just suddenly arrives as a genius. That there's a history of making that every artist is in a sense buying into or is developing a relationship with. Okay, so that, that so yeah, I mean that's absolutely right. That, that was kind of the premise and some of the conversations we had. But just to go back to the four sections that I was talking to you about, you know, this is called, of course, all interrelated to the idea of process and making. Abstract, abstract paintings history and this notion of embodied making in relation to the digital screen. So all that kind of comes in together. In fact, I would say they're probably the, the motivating factors for coming up with the premise. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But can I, can I make a quick request um, to the audience here? I foolishly haven't brought in the literature from the show <laughs> and I would like, if anyone has a spare copy, thank you. <laughs> It'd be very helpful for us to. Oh, I, can, I can give it back to you. Um, thank you very much. Brilliant. Um, because I, I'd, I'd very much like um, us to also talk about the processes now. Yeah. Um, and as you see, there are lots of many different kind of mediums being used. Um, And I think in the press release, we refer to, especially at the end, if I remember correctly, we, uh, we, we, we refer to the fact that selected artists give free reign to a level, level, a level of visual and conceptual invention synonymous with the legacies of abstract art. So there's a self-conscious rethinking or reworking of the histories and possibly the values of abstract art from the past. And that's a big issue, and we can talk about that in the next section. 
We also say, but crucially, they also call out the, the collegiac impulse to atomize, sorry, the collagic impulse to atomize, raise, rip apart, and critique naturalized or normalized genre boundaries or ideas about painting. Bit of a sentence there, but really it's about kind of cutting and pasting, re reimagining, reworking, and rethinking, you know, what, what kind of elements you want to put into what ostensibly could be called painting. Of course, paintings don't necessarily need, need to be uh, pictures on a wall, they could be all sorts of things. And I'm thinking of Jessica Stockhold, you know, the, the, the American artist who brings uh, painting into the physical space, and she's been doing this since probably the early 90s, late 80s. Um, and what objects she brings in are always coloured in such a way that she can create a composition with the objects. So, a sculpture painting, perhaps. So, we're talking about these artists emphasising the physical properties of the picture surface itself as a constructed or deconstructed space. So when we say that, when we, talk, when we mention that, what we're really talking about is constructing a, 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 a space in terms of the legacies of abstract painting, composition, form, colour, line, etc., etc., all things you're familiar with, all things a designer would be familiar with. But crucially, we're also talking about the notion of a deconstructed space, a critique of what that might represent. A full stop, if you like, on the modernist project or the modern project that arguably, and I mean really arguably, probably ended around about the early 1960s. The great forward utopian trajectory of painting and other arts like architecture, for example, suddenly no longer had their, their utopian impulse. And now this is a very well-known um, arena you know, talking about putting a full stop, deconstructing, yeah. Yeah. you know, what, what, those, what those utopias meant. I think we're all fairly familiar with that. Some of you guys might have heard that term postmodernism. It's really passe now, isn't it? So I think what this show is, is outlining is that's kind of happened. But what we want to do is something a little different. So what, what, um, what we say in the press release is that the artists might use the layering of, of imagery or the physical rupture of the support, take the support, do something wacky with it, or they might create other in interruptions that cast the artist's indexical mar mar making or the body's performative actions against digital representations co-opted from the screen. Well, indexical mark, an index is a sign, isn't it? It's a sign of something. When we read an index, it tells us what's going to happen in, in, say, for example, a text. So signs of making. This show asks us to reimagine the painting surface as a place of signifiance, a site of referentiality, unstable signifying chains that are relentlessly reconfigured and reconstructed with new, exotic and defiant formulations always looking beyond borders with a cultural, geographical, historical or imaginary. Now that last sentence I think we can unpack a bit in the coming half hour or so. So I hope that gives some kind of insight into what we were trying to do with the show. Um, I think perhaps at this stage we might want to, before we talk about actual processes, we might want to find out if anyone has any questions or statements or Criticisms, heckles. <laughs> okay, there's going to be plenty of time for that at the end. Um, oh, sorry. sorry. Um, just thinking about the, this reference to the digital in the, in the exhibition and, and that as a kind of cultural uh, phenomenon. Um, Painting works. Oh, got a microphone. Is this switched on? Oh, hello. Oh, good. <laughs> um, uh, does equality's work for you painting in the show, and um, you know one that's that's so central to the, the legacy of painting of, of uniqueness of a single object um, in space that the digital annihilates the, the idea of, of something being um, a 
kind of one of a kind original handmade produced thing. Is that something that you you're wanting to reflect upon as well in relation to? That is really interesting because it brings me back to the title of the show again because this is a thread that I wanted to bring together in what I was saying. We were interested in the word because it's a joining together of two words. Signification, the idea of making a sign, a statement, and defiance. Um, saying something different, saying something in response to, acting out some kind of riposte, possibly. And I think this idea of singularity of an object is an interesting tension that comes through in post-modernity, in, in a way, or coming out of post-modernity. And I know that you've talked a lot about this, about what does painting still have it, it, at this time in history? And this interface between what might be a dematerialization, a, a sort of a dissipation of individuality, uh, and where art sits with that situation and where painting sits with that situation. Yeah. And I think each of the artists, in their own way, deals with that notion of a, a singularity, a single statement um, that can't be reproduced, in a sense. You're still dealing with those, as you said, indexical mark-making process. Yeah, but not all artists make physical mm. paintings. Absolutely. No, with a brush, for example. Mm. Clearly, you know that. You know, I mean, I think some artists use um, digital techniques to make their paintings. For example, Wade Guyton, who puts, American artist who puts his canvases through a printer, um, glitches and all, and then he stretches them up and shows them. I mean, he has no physical attachment to that painting, but the painting itself is a physical object, and therefore it's, that's what it becomes. So I think there's still um, a fascination about whether you make something that physically or whether you make something digitally, I still think there's a fascination with what painting could be. Um, but that's a big question because... Mm. Don't you say, uh, I mean, I, I, it is a massive question and it's always, there's always this movement forward though with everything that you make. Um, you're constantly dealing with these things, aren't you? You're constantly negotiating. I think I'd rather talk about it as a relational um, um, part of one's work. Mm. I think whatever art you make, regardless, you know, we live in a saturated world of, of media imagery. And it's going to impact on us. Mm. It really is. And I mean, I'm, I'm of an age where I can remember, you know, when, when this, this wasn't the case. And I think that, you know, it, in, it inflects and changes the way we respond physically to the world. We were jumping ahead a little bit into, into section four, but so I'll just briefly say something. You know, our embodied selves, our physical selves in physical space like we're in now, is very different to when we're sitting in front of a screen, typing away or interacting with someone on the screen, for example, on Zoom. It's a different space. It's a different, we, we, know, we know this, but those spaces didn't exist 20 years ago, 30 years ago. And I think that this, this landscape changes the way we think about what it might mean to make a painting. So the question might then become, why bother making a painting? Audience. <laughs> <laughs> That's why we've done this show, because we think painting is important. And, and as you can see by the different styles and processes um, presented, um, there are different approaches to making paintings, but, but we've chosen paintings that reflect upon the screen to some degree. Yeah. And some of them, actually, like Wade Guyton, like Peter Lamb's small piece, you know, is made entirely technologically three printers. Yeah. Maybe that, that's a nice segue into talking about process, if that's our next. next yeah, step. before I do, I'm just mm. going to quote um, this fantastic writer called Craig Staff. I don't know if any of you know him. There's a book called After Modernist Painting by Craig Staff, 
and in, in uh, a chap one of the chapters, the later chapters, is called. Um, I think I've told you this all before, actually, but it's um, imaging the digital and imagining the digital. Now he makes that distinction by describing um, those artists who, who who image the digital are those artists, like I said, Wade Guyton, for example, or Peter Lamb, who use technological process to make the painting or the picture. The paintings are made by technology, imaging the digital. Imagine the digital artists like, for example, um, Gunter Herbst in the show, you know, the one with the explosion. He's clearly, he's clearly referencing or imagining the digital. So he refers to the screen, he doesn't directly work with digital technology. So imagined and imagined. And I've, I've used this quote a number of times, mm. I think it's a really fantastic way into talking about the mm. processes of the artists that we actually Absolutely. have chosen. Yeah, sure. quite, quite. Maybe you could talk a little bit about Simon Pike's process. Yeah, absolutely. In terms of um, the way what he's doing is, is, is finding imagery on the screen. In fact, it's a very interesting combination, which I think is the same with your work, Mike. It's an interesting combination of collecting information from the web and then going through a process of layering this information through stencils and uh, the layering of very beautiful beautifully modulated colour and building up uh, these images to such a point that it's very difficult to define exactly uh, what's going on and what you can see and you're, you're sucked into the surface of the painting and then you're brought back out again um, and this process, this process of being taken in to the painting and being brought out again in some ways reflects this quality of imagining and imaging uh, yeah, there's a duality there. Simon's work, just to remind you, when you look at them, you think, you know, when I first saw them, I thought they were digitally produced. I thought, you know, they were done in Photoshop. And um, yeah. when you see it for real, you, you can see it's physically made. So it's an interesting kind of, there's an interesting tension between the two. Yeah, yeah. It's almost like he's, it's almost like being a landscape painter in, I don't know, in the 18th century in Britain, you know, and you're, you're out there plein air, you know, like John Constable painting the hay wagon. Um, he, he's, like, he's doing the same thing, he's, he's copying the screen, yeah. perhaps. Yeah, absolutely. The style of the screen. So this, this sort of feedback loop, um, I think somehow reflects a, a, maybe the way we are thinking and being, as you suggested a moment ago. Uh, it, it gives us a way into the thought processes, the physical interaction with the screens that we might be dealing with every day. Um, and, and, it's, and I think that's what he touches on uh, really beautifully in his work, is that, that tension between the two, the physical, the imagined, and the imaginary, I think. Um, as you say, with, with Gunther Herb's work, um, there's a, again, there's a strange sense of that, of, of uh, looking at that imagery, you know, I was thinking of those explosions, and thinking about what's happening in the world today, um, the imagery that we've been bombarded with for the last few weeks from Ukraine and, and, and uh, you know, other places in the world as well. Uh, and the way that we consume those images. Um, and I think, I still think, getting back to your point, there's a, something about painting that captures something and distances you from something as much as it pulls you in. It operates as a singular image. Mm. It operates in a different way. But it also gives us opportunity to all, do all sorts of space, for the, uh, all sorts of weird things with optical space. Yeah, yeah. Um, I know you can do that again on the screen, <coughs> quite self-consciously, but Gunther's painting is a, point in, 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 is a good example. In that painting, if you look on the bottom, there's a kind of what looks like a seascape. And the, 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 the scape above it sits awkwardly in optical space. It's, it's, in, it's, it's as if it's coming forward towards the audience when it should be receding. And I think one of the things that painting plays with, and that's uh, uh, abstract painting plays with, which is taken from classical painting via 
50s abstractions like Hans Hoffmann, is the, is, is, is the kind of <coughs> the play of optical receding and forward kind of space. Mm. And that's very difficult to kind of mini on the screen. Yeah. I mean, I know you can get it when you rip up magazines and do a collage because you're putting things from different areas with different scales, with different colours, with different machines or surfaces. But when you're manipulating paint, you're, you're having to be so much more clever with the way edges meet, with how you um, extend optical space through the act of making. It's, 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 it's a skill. And I don't just mean a technical skill, like I'm really good at painting, it's just, it's a skill that needs, needs thinking about and practice, perhaps. No, mm, absolutely, absolutely. That's killed off the conversation, isn't it? Because <laughs> <laughs> we're getting all technical now, talking about painting, which is the fun bit. <laughs> all the rest of it is just context around <laughs> You know, when you're in, when you, someone once asked me in a talk, um, I gave a, I gave a, um, a paper in a conference, and it was all very you know, academic. And uh, and someone said to me, "Oh, um, do you think about these things when you were stu in your studio?" <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm using a completely different side of my brain. You know. Mm. I'm using my more intuitive side. I'm using thinking about whether red goes with mix of blue, mm. whether I can get how I'm going to make optical space operate, mm. etc., etc. Yeah. What yeah. kind of how is the composition making, making sense? Yeah, yeah. But it's interesting to looking at your work from um, in this context. There's a term you use calling yourself a neo formalist. Mm. Yeah. And the way you wish I wish I'd said that. Yeah, but the, the way you're talking about your painting at that moment is exactly about the formal organisation of a painting. Yeah. Being totally involved in creating this. But crucially, yeah, what, what a lot of these artists do at the same time, and they very much count themselves within that, is that they as as they put that formalism together, they make a, you, know, you make we make a nice design, right? That's what formalism isn't. Could, could be reduced to, and that's a bigger issue to talk about. But we haven't got time for that. But you know, when, when, when a tutor says, "Oh, that works," what they usually mean is that red sits in conjunction with that blue really nicely against that orange, blah blah blah. So you made a nice design. So what? I think what's interesting about most of the artists that we've chosen here is that whilst they do that simultaneously, and it is simultaneous, there are other things contradicting, reacting with, overlapping with, and kind of screwing with that design, stroke, composition. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's important. So there's a self-conscious referencing of yeah. the fact that certain abstract histories have become defined yeah. and have become pure design. Charlie Peters is a very interesting example exactly. of that. Yeah. It's very much in your face. There are elements of what I'd take to be a 50s, 60s kind of painterliness, uh, abstract painting in her work, then you have some grid-like formations that might come out of 60s minimalism. Then you have the early gaming culture, you know, from the 80s into the 90s, with these icons that, that occur throughout the paintings. So it's this incredible crushing together of these uh, very different uh, images and imagery. Uh, and being forced together in these new combinations. But again, you know, as you say, there's this quality of organisation and structure uh, that make, makes her work incredibly, you know, uh, lookable at. It, it wants you to look at it. But I'm just looking at the piece here, which is not in the show, but which yeah. you can see. And you can see the grip awkward optical space in there, yeah, which is kind yeah. of designed. And I find that very interesting. Yeah. So there's a sense that, there's a self-conscious sense, I think, with all the artists in the show, that they recognise the limits of, of the history of abstract painting as you know, form, form over content in the first instance, and form for form's sake. You know, it is just about colour, paint, composition, etc. They recognise the limits of that, which was deconstructed back to the 80s and 90s, which we'll talk about earlier on. 
but they also reutilize it. And they use reutilize it, in my, my opinion, um, as uh, by really kind of throwing in not just other different cultural symbols to kind of screw with that, yeah. which we're very familiar with, say, through from the kind of postmodern paintings of Fiona Ray, for example. Yeah, yeah. Um, but by 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 re by reusing um, painting techniques from a whole bunch of histories, uh, yeah. usually in Western art, only exclusively, to 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 re-render optical space. And I think a lot of this work appears as quite flat, not all of it. And often a lot of it tends to kind of slide off the edges of the canvas. And that's deliberate. So a lot of these paintings kind of come across as fragments of something. Like this painting here by Peter Lamb, which is again not in the show. It feels like a, it feels like a digital fragment of something much wider. Mm. It suggests that the world is beyond the painting. It suggests the world is beyond the studio. And I think that's really interesting. Yeah, yeah. So in a sense, what we've done now, we've briefly talked about process. We've briefly talked about abstract painting history really quickly. And I hope our pub style conversation is not going to be too boring. <laughs> but <laughs> as you can see, we haven't rehearsed this at all. Um, <laughs> but this is how we talk. Sadly. <laughs> <laughs> but are there any other questions or comments or about process? There's a, there's, a, there's a question here about the microphone. Hello. So yeah, it's kind of slightly less about process. So while viewing all the artworks, I notice that there is this sort of while each artist is naturally unique, there is this concept of two ideas married together, like signifiers, where you have sort of the more classical techniques, like realistic or abstract or contemporary, married with these elements of sort of like mid-90s to 2000s kind of internet culture. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering where that kind of contrast comes in with your personal ideologies or practice and where you think sort of the next step is, like how many posts do we add to modernism? Like, what, what comes next? That's a really great question. Yeah. The reason it's great is because um, modernism is this great overarching issue, or, 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 or almost like a like carrying a dead weight on your, on your shoulders. And um, I think what's happening, theoretically, philosophically, artistically, is that when that break got put on, from, on modernism, through deconstruction, post-structuralism, post-modernism, to ask questions of the validity of that, of the forward utopian direction. I'm talking very generally about modernism. Forward utopian uh, direction of modernism, and in particular in painting, the notion of form being the entire content of the painting, nothing else, no imagery, for example, I'm quoting Greenberg here, um, playing Greenberg, the 50s critic. Um, I think where we, my, 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 my argument has been in the last few years that we're actually living in, I think, an extended postmodern period. But on the other hand, we don't need the kind of, what this work is not trying to do is be ironic. It's not trying to take the piss out of abstract writing that was prevalent, say, in the 80s. Mm. This work seems to kind of recognise that there's perhaps a reworking of, there's, there's something in modern, modern, modernist painting that I think perhaps has been overlooked. I mean, that, that, and that brings what you were talking about, the, the other overarching issue with modernism in the sense was this notion of progress. Uh, you know, to the, the other side to the utopian idea was this idea that painting would become more and more and more abstract, it would be more and more and more ratified. Uh, but obviously, we could all see that ultimately you would end up with practically nothing. It's a reductive uh, A reductive process that goes on and on and on and on until you reach apparently some great pinnacle in the sky. Now, we all know that that, in, in many respects, is a, a silly fabrication. It no longer holds, in any sense, it doesn't hold water. Well, it's also very narrow and conceited. Uh, absolutely. But what we have got, though, is this heritage these fantastic formal innovations 
a history of art that's full of potential. And in a way, once painting, if, if you like, disengages itself, because that was the other thing about Greenberg and other critics, was that painting was perceived as the highest of the art forms. That was where the, the, the most uh, you know, advanced uh, visual experience could be found. But yeah, once, and it had the longest history. And it had, this, of, yeah. of course, a huge history. Once you disengage painting from this uh, huge, great weight, as you put on your shoulders about what it's supposed to be, you're suddenly free. That you can do what you want with painting. Yeah, we were talking about this earlier on when we were in yeah. outside. We were, we were saying, you know, what, I, what I find really interesting talking to students about now is not, are not worrying about you know, the legacy of modernism. Because it's just a it kind of it's kind, those values are sort of irrelevant and they're not they're not necessary. I, what I find with students, they just paint anything they want because they they are you guys are free of that. You can do what you like. You're not part of that full stop break culture. Um, and I think that what that what that allows you to do is be very liberated. But I think at the same time, it's important to. Still think about what you're doing as painting within the context of painting and its histories. That's a big. That's a big number, but it's attention. You're, I mean, you're, 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 yeah, one is one is self-consciously an art school making a painting. You're immediately in the context of being part of a painting culture. That's it. That's right. It's like what I said earlier about te about intertextuality. Yeah. yeah. That the text is is in what you bring to it as much as is what given to you by an individual author and it's about that, di that dialectic between yeah. what you're bringing to something that goes way one back of, one, of the, one of the things that I find really interesting with younger artists work in this in this arena that we're talking about here is the fact they bring a lot of um, a lot of stuff from outside the studio unlike modernist artists or postmodern artists who just wanted to kind of reflect upon or Parody. Deconstruct or parody uh, modernist painting. There's a lot more. Um, there's, there's a much bigger world out there. The screen, for example, gives us so much information. It's all that stuff that's going into the paintings that makes them interesting. I don't mean you have to refer to the screen. I'm not talking about that. Yeah. yeah. Don't, you don't have to make a painting that you, something you've seen on the screen, like a political painting or whatever. But I think that there is much more. We, we, there is a very diverse and big kind of geopolitical kind of situation happening <laughs> in the world yeah. um, that is that is that we are aware of and, you know and, and because it's out there it's in the air it's gonna it's gonna invest itself in how you express yourselves through making a painting regardless of what style you use whether you make a gestural abstract painting or whether you make a hard edge tight painting or whatever or whatever style I hope that sort of makes sense does that kind of answer the question? No. <laughs> ask me another question. Ask us another question. Um. <laughs> uh, I, I think I think I get the feeling I get the feeling that there's something that you wanted to say. It was, and it was perhaps we haven't picked up on it. While there are these sort of ideas of modernism not necessarily as a progressing thing. Yeah. I'm not sure. But what do you think would be the next step? Or as a separate question, well, okay. how do you think the contact the, the contrast between classical techniques and sort of modern culture relates to why you picked it for this exhibition? Okay, that's that's two questions there I think. One you can you can pick one. Alright. <laughs> I'm gonna start with the first one. The first one you said what is the next thing, right? And that's that's a you're falling into a very modernist trap there, you know. Like there is a linear progression where we 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 we, we construct a new reality. We we have a we have an avant-garde that rejects it, and this continues. So I think we might want to kind of maybe turn the question around and say, what are the conditions that we're in at the moment? Okay, so that's hopefully answering question one. Perhaps not. The other question is. Um, to do with classical painting tropes and abstract painting tropes. So can you repeat that one? So the sort of underpaintings are sort of 
using more classical techniques, like either sort of realistic-ish paintings, like the explosion and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. It's semi-realistic, or sort of abstract or contemporary painting, and then it's overlaid with these sort of icons of yeah. sort of mid '90s to 2000s internet culture. Yeah. And the contrast between those two things, I was wondering um, what it was about that that attracted you to those paintings. Very much that. But uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I do think to a certain degree, it's not to get caught up too much in, um, as Mike said, about notions of... of um, for me, it really, I wanted to explore some artists here who were dealing with, and this is also very difficult for, for a lot of artists, especially young artists who are coming to terms with what they're doing, is that these artists are playing around in a way, in a different way, with notions of, I think, of, you know, the original statement. That we're always looking for the next original statement, something we haven't seen before. Um, but we all know in a way that this notion of originality is <sighs> overshadowed by uh, this bigger history. Yeah. Uh, and, and I think that... It's a um, trope. It's, it's, it's yeah, a trope, even a cliche. Uh, right. These are, for, for me, I think, uh, part of the reason for selecting the arts we did is, is that, and Mike's touched on this, is that there's a freedom of invention, okay, in what they're doing. Uh, it's not weighed down, okay, it's not overshadowed. And we were looking for artists who were uh, more, pro you know, more than prepared to, as you pointed out, as you'd seen insightfully, they're prepared to play around with these different uh, conventions from the history of painting. And I think that separates, that, that moves forward as well. There's, a, there's a, an ability to see uh, these different qualities in relation to each other. Uh, not necessarily balanced, but they're allowed to exist on the same picture plane with the same sort of uh, quality of intention behind their making, if you see what I mean. Yeah, John, uh, John Chilver in his painting, yeah. this is not the painting in the show by the way, but it's the small one next to Gunter's painting that we've been talking about, the explosion. I mean, he, he, he in, in the text here, he talks about um, artwork and writing co coalescing around problems of agency, how we make sense of things and how, we, how, that, how that agency kind of presents itself to an audience. And he, he then goes on to talk about um, how these problems lead him to philosophies of the event and questions of how the new appears at all. So mm. it's almost like an unanswerable question because what is the new? After modernism, what is the new? And we're in this kind of ever-present now, it seems to me, mm. perhaps. And that's how I feel. I don't necessarily... And that needn't be a deadening thing. No, I think, I think, I think, I think, said, I think that could be a, it's a replete, with, it's replete with possibility. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so um, we need to move on to the last section, which is our fourth part of the talk. As you can see, we wrote this down earlier on. But I don't know who did this drawing, but it's really fantastic. <laughs> All my sons are. Oh, it's, oh right, there you go. Um, um, We've got down here embodied making disembodied screen. And we've talked a little bit about that, that relationship between physical making and how we, how we interact with the screen. Would you like to say anything on that, John? Well, or have, I mean, I or have we said it all? No, I don't think we have. I think it's interesting as well in, in, in terms of uh, the last question, just, just uh, bring that to, to this, this section of the talk, is that um, there are at least two artists in the show, including myself and Phil Franklin, I think, mm. who are kind of operating in the other direction. Yeah. The, uh, that was something else we wanted the show to kind of work with, with the artists who were working with the materiality of stuff, uh, which works in contradistinction, obviously, to the, the, the idea of the dematerialised. And it, for me, it was important to bring these kind of paintings in relation to each other. So, you know, with, with John, John Chiller, we have that, you know, highly illusionistic space yeah. that's uh, mysterious space. Yeah. 
Um, we, have other, we have other artists who reflect on the screen, Charlie Peters, myself, for example. Exactly. That could, you know, that have that, have yeah. that look. Yeah. Um, and I think that given what we've just been talking about, I think it's important to realise that um, for all of us, regardless of whether there's very thick, collagic um, yeah. elements put together, like in your painting, you know, that work, you know, that work is made now. And yeah, it's, and, and exactly. it's part of now, yeah. and it's you're part of a bigger thing. Yeah, yeah. That is not just painting and painting's history. Yeah. yeah, you're far more part of a visual culture, which is all around us. Yeah, and I think it's that visual culture that's all around us that inflects upon, yeah. or reflects upon. Yeah, all of the artists in the show, once again, uh, regardless of style. In terms of your work, Mike. Uh, the things about it's very interesting seeing your work on a screen because they really do they seem to uh, inhabit that space very naturally but when you see a painting by yours in the flesh you realize that they are real material objects mm -hmm. they have densities mm -hmm. they have layering which are which are obvious with with silent pikes layering there's more of a sense of an opaque mm -hmm. sense of you know very you know, very smooth, very delicate sometimes qualities going on. With your work, there is, a, I think, a, a forthrightness about their materiality in real, when you see them for Even real. though they're flat and flat and flat and flat. But they still have yeah. that density to them. But that's important to me as it is to any of the artists. Mm. And I think, you know, it's a question of, where, just a question of whether you want something thick and impasto, yeah. gestural, yeah. or whether you want something flat. But um, but no, I, I want my, personally. But I mean, we're not here just to talk about us two. Um, my those paint my paintings are deliberately physical, even though they are flat layers, yeah. flat-ish layers, yeah. without a millimeter deep. So you get you get you get the sensation of both. Yeah, but their forthrightness rightness is very clear. With with someone like Phil Franklin's that that small, very delicate piece in the corner space, um, there's an only just there-ness yeah. about his work. Yeah. Uh, with mine, you've got, you know, again, a, a quite forthright materiality. Um, with his, I thought it was really interesting to play his against, say, John's again, yeah. where you have a very delicate, illusionistic space. With Phil, you have this, only, this material presence but there's only just there. And that's what we wanted. We wanted that variety in the yeah. show. Yeah. Given the four questions or four um, themes, if you like. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that we've chosen to talk about tonight. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. I keep thinking we've missed something out, actually, but I can't think what. <laughs> um, there's are, always that feeling. Are there? Are there? Are there any um, other questions? Or anything else? What, what is it? What is it we've missed out? There's a question. Yeah. yeah. Two things. One thing, you dropped a lot of there. Oh, um, oh my God! Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> is that the question? Yeah. yeah. All yeah. oh, right. Thank you. <laughs> the question is, is: I wonder if the concepts of modernism and postmodernism are almost limiting patterns of language where you should be focusing more on the expression of your concepts and thinking about pushing things further forward. No. Uh, how do you mean pushing things further forward? So, we're, we're, you're talking about sort of, um, you're talking about modernism and pushing artistic concepts forward and doing something new in the kind of... I'm not sure we are talking about no. pushing something into well, the that new. Well, that was a frame, that but that was, a, that was something that I think we're reacting, I think a lot of artists are, are, are trying to sort of deal with and react with, and it for or against, usually in some sort of, there, there is this idea of modernism as this progress towards this perfect place in art, whatever that is. Painting was the standard bearer for that notion. And in order to get there, you had to destroy what was, what was before. Yeah. I don't think that's possible or even relevant or even, so I think, so I, think, I think what we're trying to do is acknowledge just what's around us. And visual culture just informs this weird thing that's happened Cool painting that's had this weird history. But I liked what you said about the, the, the bit before that about an artist exploring what was that again, a concept or a con. I don't know, the, the, the idea that being stuck in, in 
getting getting stuff in the earlier moments and, and try and sort of put down the terminology and just express yourself without putting yourself in some kind of pigeonhole yeah. like being a modern struggle to one this. Yeah, I, I, I think that, that does touch on um, it, but it but it's also the other bit, which is the bit about being aware of one's place in that history of making. Mm. So it, it, you know, I, every every arts student has to go through that process of realizing that they are not this bringer of something entirely fantastically new to the world. Mm. That they are part of and they belong to, like I said right at the beginning in a way, that they they belong to, they find connections with histories mm. of making. Mm. Uh, and what we've done really, I think, is try to open out what those histories can be for a start. That was the first sort of breakdown in a way of modernism. It's understanding that there, there are huge histories of making that have got nothing to do with Western art, for instance, for a start. Yeah, yeah. Um, or there are you know there are classes who have been ignored in the history of making, uh, you know the, the whole idea of there being. I mean that was what we were saying earlier as well. Elizabeth Murray. I don't know if you know the art critic Jerry Saltz. Sometimes he 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 he'll quote an artist. There was a fantastic quote by her. It's a bad paraphrase, but she said, "The history of art is for the boys. I can do what I like." Okay. And in a way, that kind of sums up to a certain degree what we've been talking yeah, about. Yeah, that's kind of what I was saying earlier You've on. You've got this ambivalent relationship with history. Yeah. It's always under, you know, there's a pressure, but there's also, you can turn that off. Yeah. Or you can put it in its place. And if I, like, so I would say it's actually to your benefit to learn as much from history in order to recognise what you can borrow, steal. Yeah, yeah. What did Andy Warhol say? Bad artists borrow, good artists steal. Hmm. There's a question here. Um, is the microphone anywhere? Yeah, try to pass it. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Certainly, I know for me, I find it. I, I think painters nowadays are sort of like sponges because there's so much happening and there's such a sort of bottleneck in of yeah. history. Yeah. And all this kind of this kind of grouping of everything is kind of happening once you sort of see it a lot in like music as well. And I mean, certainly for me, I find it difficult to sort of filter, I guess, on whether or not you need to filter that kind of information and how you sort of approach the idea of everything kind of happening at once and that ability to um, have everything at your fingertips at once. I was just wanting to uh, think about um, you two as artists, the idea of, I think filtering is quite important and um, I just wanted to sort of see what you thought about the idea of dealing with that amount of information, how you do kind of take all that Sort of, sort of gluttony of information and how you sort of deal with it, calm it down, and then bring it out in your. The, the, I think the key, the key word you use there was filtering. Mm -hmm. You know, you just have to find filters that are necessary for you. you know, what do you what you know when you turn your screen on in the morning? What do you look at most? <laughs> you know, there's there's something in that. You know, maybe that's where the interests are. Um, so yeah, you have to sort of make choices there's too much stuff out there um, but then again you might be an artist who decides to put all that stuff into your work how do you want to operate do you want to say I only want to pick this this and this and this or do I want everything in the work they're just different ways of working I think that that, that process I mean this is uh, Phil Franken by the way who's in the show uh, and it's, um, I think um, I think it is about process. I mean, it really is fundamentally about uh, what you 
working through the material that you deal with. Um, that process of jettisoning, keeping things, leaving things behind, looking to what you might use next, that constant uh, juggling that goes on, I think, in yeah, the process. Yeah, I mean, I just see very much see that in your work, Phil. I mean, I work the same way. I mean, I'm just constantly just kind of, I've got an image bank of stuff that I find interesting. I found techniques that I, I found that I can utilize to my advantage and that can speak about the concerns that I'm interested in. And it sometimes, especially with physical making, it takes time to work all that stuff out. Perhaps. I mean, that is the, 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 the process, I think. I mean, I was talking to uh, an ex-student earlier this evening, and I think there are those, you know, you had a really interesting time here, you know, during COVID and all that, that process of still trying to, to learn and, uh, and experiment and, and push your push a medium. I don't think that changes once you're out of the education system. I think that it becomes more intense in a way. You may leave with a set of, um, you know, you know certain things when you leave, hopefully. <laughs> What's driving you? What are the issues that are pushing you? What are the, the things that you're over, overcoming in your process? Yeah, one of the, one of the things that we, we've all, always talked about with this show and other shows is that both of us have real problems with painting. We don't believe it. We don't believe it's, it's, it's utopian trajectory for modernism. We don't believe that the full stop of postmodernism was the, was, the, was the end game of all painting and therefore we were at point zero of painting. You know, I think in a sense we, we are, we're, we're almost meta-modernists in that we are reworking the values, not the values. We're reworking the styles and in relation to this big world around us to, to think about how to make a painting. Yeah, yeah. But we've always had a problem with painting because we recognise the limitations of its history. And, and you know, I, this is also the, the thing about organising exhibitions is that it all comes down to those those issues that one of the reasons and drivers, if you like, for, for bringing artists together and showing work is, is it, you know, for those fundamental reasons. You want to see how artists are dealing with these issues on their own terms. And often when you bring artists together, you begin to get a picture. Uh, things start to emerge, you know, combinations of imagery are repeated. Um, you know, like I said, artists don't exist, you know, in this strange uh, other world, they exist in the real world. It's really interesting to say to see how different artists are dealing with the similar issues that we're dealing with, um, and and you learn from that process uh, by bringing these paintings by different artists in relation to each other. You see how these different artists are working through what every artist, in a way, has to deal with uh, in their own way. Okay. Um, any final comments or? Questions, even. Can I just, can I quickly say, oh, Rick, this is a sales pitch. <laughs> At the moment, in Terp, this this uh, episode of Terps Banana Painting Magazine, me and Mike are in here discussing Mike's uh, paintings from the 90s, which I think, in fact, and the discussion we have in this magazine touches on and also elucidates in a different way by looking back in time at uh, some of the issues that, you're, that we're, we're dealing with this evening. And, and I think it, it's an interesting read. Go and get one and have a look. It's full of other fascinating stuff too. Only £16. Pounds. That's all. <laughs> Can I just... What's in there? Sorry. Oh, yeah. sorry. <laughs> yeah, uh, just to, to say, you, you spoke earlier about the uh, hybrid show which you learned from the Tate. Yeah. 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 Famously yeah. used in the TV screen in the bed. Yes. Sort of objection and, and that. Uh, you mean this? Yeah, the yeah. link to um, the Alfred Hitchcock film and all that stuff. And I just wonder there uh, how some of the things that you're talking about today, painting from today, and stuff, all the stuff that's going on in the gallery, how intrinsically linked is that to that, to that show? Do you see that show as being a really. I saw it as like being a really groundbreaking and kind of. Yeah. It's yeah. one of those shows that you go to the wall, wow, anything's possible. Yeah. 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 It touches on a lot. It touches on a lot of the things we're talking about in the essays. But tragically, tragically, this book I think is out of print. 
I mean, if you do find it online, you'll be paying a lot of money for it. Unless, 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 unless you can get something out of Tate Liverpool for your library here. Um, I've often recommended this book yeah. to be told, you can't get it. But yeah, it was Tony. I mean, I never saw the show, to be honest with you. Did you, did you no, see it? No. I, I just picked up the catalogue and I remember in 2001, it sort of blew my head away, really. You know, you've got, um, who have you got in here? Beatrice Milhays, you've yeah. got Fiona Ray, you've got um, David Reed, David Reed, Reed Fabio Marcaccio, you've got Philip Guston, I don't think he was in it, uh, Inca Essenhai, um, Su uh, Sarah Morris, but I think, yeah. I think, I think, Although this show is 21 years old now, I think we share a lot. Yeah, 21 years ago. Um, we share a lot of its values, I think. And I think it was groundbreaking, you know. And I, I, I bought this in about 2003, I think, this catalogue. Um, and I still refer to it. I've still used it in texts that I've written because I think it's still with us. And I think I was talking about this earlier on, about how we're in this extended moment. Um, not postmodernism. I know I said that earlier on because that has certain implications as to, as to full stops. But we're certainly in this kind of extended moment of, of the ever-present now, which is, I think comes through the screen culture. We're right in the moment all the time, aren't we? And we're only in the moment. And there's another moment, another moment. And I think this anticipated that, but as painting. And I think I would say I would say yes, Tony. I think this arguably is a model for our show. Here today. Hmm. Okay. Well, I hope our pub conversation wasn't too dull. Um, and thank you very much for coming and being patient with us and, and for the great questions. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Thanks very much.